Okay, I'm Sunita Narayan from the Center for Science and Environment, um, and my colleague, uh, Chandra Bhushan. Um, we are a tele-based um, uh, center which does research on environment and development issues. Uh, we push for policy change in India, and we push for policy change across the world. Uh, CB, your initial sure. comments, and then we will... Good evening. Uh, my initial comment is that we are actually looking at a weak, inequitable, and unambitious deal at Paris. Uh, some of the most important component, uh, including mitigation commitments and financial commitments, are not likely to be legally binding. We find the language on loss and dam is weak. This deal promises finance, but hesitates to commit. Frankly, from the perspective of Center for Science and Environment, we want an ambitious deal. But that ambitious ambition, on one hand, must ensure that there is enough carbon space for the livelihoods of billions of people, as well as shield them from the worst impacts of climate change. What we are looking at this draft text is complete dilution of commitment of developed countries and shifting of burden to the developing countries. In fact, if this draft text becomes an agreement, for the first time, there will not be a collective target for developed countries on mitigation. There will not be an individual target for developed countries on mitigation. Please remember, from the Kyoto regime, where there was a collective target and an individual target, Nothing of that sort is going to remain from 2020 onwards. There is also a lack of clear time period in which developed countries are going to take collective as well as individual action. The fact is, the fight here is about life cycle of some, lifestyle of some to the livelihoods of the millions. And we are really sad to see that in the current text, there is not even a mention of fair allocation of carbon budget. Now, with this, I will now ask Sunita to discuss why the term fair allocation of carbon budget is key to, for us, for getting an ambitious and equitable deal at Paris. Thank you, CB. Um, <clears throat> CSE's position has been, for many years now, we produced a report in 1991 called Global Warming in an Unequal World, a case of environmental colonialism. And then and now, our position has been that we want ambition on climate change, but we do not want climate change to further inequity in inequality in the world. When we look at what is the draft yesterday, one of the worst components of the draft, the difference between the earlier draft, which at least had the mention of the word carbon budget, that is completely missing in the draft that we have last night. And the reason CSE is very uh, concerned about this, and we hope that you will share our concern, is that we know that the question about cutting emissions is really about sharing the limited carbon budget that remains between now and 2100. We know very clearly, and that has been accepted, that the aggregate emissions which have been promised through the INDCs will not keep the world below the two degree target. So the entire issue now is how will you ratchet up so that you have ambition in the deal? And the question of ratcheting up is who will cut emissions and how much? When you look at this, we have put together this data which actually looks at how the carbon budget has been appropriated or misappropriated between 1850 to 2011. If you take the United States, which I particularly want to point out here because it is a country which has come out with all flags um, rearing in this uh, COP saying that it is the climate change leader, it is one country which has appropriated 21% of the carbon budget between 1850 to 2011. And that is the past. 
The question is, what do we do in the future? We know that the target that the world is talking about, if it is two degrees, then you have something like a thousand gigatons of carbon dioxide left between now and 2100, if it's two degrees. If it's 1.5 degrees, the carbon budget shrinks. And it shrinks to the point that you have anywhere between 400 to 550 gigatons left. So the question is not whether you agree to two degrees or you agree to 1.5 degree. The question is, how will you share the carbon budget between the past and the future? And if you look at the INDCs of the same countries that I have talked about, then if you take the next graph, and this graph, sorry, this graph that my colleague Aruna has put up now, you will see our calculation. Sorry, Aruna, the same one. Yes, this one. If you look at this, we have calculated now what would be the appropriation of the remaining carbon budget between now and 2030. If you take the INDC that have been put forward by the countries, if you take the same United States, then 21% has been appropriated in the past, and the lack of ambition of the U.S. means that it will appropriate another 10%, 8 to 10% between now and 2030. So INDC today, in today's climate regime, is about surreptitious appropriation of the remaining carbon budget because it is not part of the way the INDC it put forward, but it is what happens given the numbers you put on the table. And what we at CSC have been saying again and again is that if you want, if you put together the INDCs of all the countries, then 80% of the remaining budget, and that's for two degrees, finishes by 2030. If you can see the next graph, Aruna, this is the chart put forward by the UNFCC, which itself accepts that by 2030, given the INDCs that are on the table today, the bulk of the remaining carbon budget will be finished. Now, if you take the same chart and you take a 1.5 degree challenge, the 1.5 degree challenge is 550 gigawatts, which is remains, which means that you have to talk about negative growth in the developed world if you want to have any sense of fair share between now and 2030. And that's the debate that we don't hear in Paris. We don't hear the issue about fair share of the carbon budget. We hear words about ambition, about 1.5 degree, knowing fully well, and for many of the people in the room, and I can recognize many friends in the room who, like me, have been following climate negotiations since 1991, let's be very clear, 1.5 degree is not a new invention. It is being talked about by scientists for the last 15 years, 20 years, but it was inconvenient to talk about 1.5 degrees because then you would be talking about the use of the carbon budget by the rich. Now that it has already been consumed, you cannot vacate the space, and so it is convenient to talk about it. So from CSE's perspective, we believe that we want an ambitious deal, we want a reference to the 1.5 degrees, we want the world to stay at 1.5 degrees because coming from India, we are already seeing the worst impacts of climate change. We know the pain of extreme weather events. But if we want a reference to 1.5 degrees, then we want the reference to go with a clear, an absolutely clear reference to sharing the available carbon budget. The fair share to a carbon budget has to be part of the text. Otherwise, let us be very clear, we are not operationalizing equity. 
we are creating a uh, uh, climate change regime which is built on intolerance, which is built on intolerance of the voice of the powerless, which is built, which actually furthers climate change apartheid. And I think that's what socialist France needs to think about as it signs on this deal, and it, it is the host of this conference, that is it going to be party to a climate change regime which actually makes sure that the poor have no share of the space. Thank you very much. Okay. So we will take questions. No, uh, we've kept it brief, so we have 15 minutes. Yes, we have 15 minutes, enough time for questions. And maybe three questions at a time. Okay. Yes. And if you could introduce yourself, it yes. would help. Uh, good evening. I'm uh, uh, Manisi Ahmed. I'm uh, working for Shekwa as an advisor. And I have two questions. Uh, first of all, I, I fully support what uh, CSC has been saying about the carbon budget. And it's very clear. Figures are there. I mean, cannot be disputed. So I'm just wondering whether we are not seeing a new sort of uh, energy, energetic world order being put in place so that some uh, countries, as it has been in the past, will have the luxury to continue their development. And the second one, just wondering also if uh, at all there will be an agreement, let's say by tomorrow, whatever agreement, but it, it would look anyway uh, weaker than what was expected in the very beginning of this conference, then uh, would it not be just to save the private Fabius because we need a, a, an agreement by tomorrow? Thank you. Okay. Uh, take two more questions and then, please. Um, two questions. The first one is you've done this for a carbon budget. Could the same study be done for greenhouse gases in total? It would be a little more complicated. Hmm. The second question is how much development assistance would it take for India to be able to skip coal to move into green energy directly? How much would the developing countries need to contribute to make that happen? Okay. Last one. One more. Gento, can you? Vegeta. Gento. Can we have a mic there? Can we have the mic? Uh, Jayant Basa from Telegraph India. Two quick questions. One is that uh, after looking towards the draft, how you rate the, find the draft that has come up, how you rate it on the key aspects like differentiation, finance, or adaptation, mitigation? That's number one. And number two is that uh, Sunita has just referred about that the kind of an improbability of 1.5 as a business as usual scenario. So do you think that has it been brought on table in Paris to put pressure on countries like India? Okay. Uh, Sunita, so why don't you take the first and third one? I'll take the second one. Fine. Question, yeah. So I think the first question is really about the agreement and whether um, whether we should whether they, a weak agreement is uh, better than no agreement. Um, I do think that the world deserves more than a weak agreement, and I do hope between now and tomorrow that um, uh, that there will be better sense um, that will prevail. But I do want to make it very clear that the effort of the last week, which was to try and turn, to change the image of the more polluting countries and make them believe that they are the leaders in these negotiations, is something that we as civil society should make sure that we put that picture right, that we don't let that become the reason to say that it wasn't countries like the U.S. which failed Paris, but that it was countries like India and China that failed Paris. I think that is uh, something that, and I, I say this knowing very, very clearly that uh, the media of the Western world is very powerful, and um, I do understand that world opinion is made by them and not by us, but reg still, I would have the gumption of saying that here. Um, as far as... Um, the question of the draft is concerned, the current draft is concerned. I think CSE's opinion is very clear. It is a weak, 
It works towards a weak, unambitious agreement in Paris. It is regressive as compared to equity as concerned. So if I was to give you a quick scoring of the different elements, I would definitely think that the issue of mitigation um, targets is, is extremely weak, and um, I would give it negative points. I would say on that basis, as the current draft exists, I don't think India should sign it. And I would go as far as saying that on mitigation. As far as finance is concerned, it has some right words about it, but we always know that the issue of finance, and I think CB will answer the question of how much money is needed, we never see the money. Uh, we only see it on paper. So if governments, our governments are taken in by fancy words of finance, and they give away uh, the right to a fair um, space on carbon budget for a little bit of money, I think, or for the illusion of money, I think that would, be that would be doing very grave injustice to the millions in the world who do not have access to energy even today. As far as loss and damage is concerned, I think it's, it's absolutely, and I'll use a very strong word here, I know the UN doesn't like strong words, but I will still use it. Um, I would think it's contemptuous, the fact that you have said that liability and compensation will not be part of it. That is unacceptable. And again, the, the corridors were buzzing yesterday that it was a deal being made between 1.5 degrees versus uh, um, compensation and liability. I think that is the worst possible deal that any government can make for its people. And I would again think that that should not happen. See. Okay. Uh, actually, global carbon budget is of total GHG, greenhouse gases, and total numbers can be put out. Uh, uh, so that's not a problem. Those numbers are available in IPCC. Extrapolations can be done. The number of papers. So the budget is about total greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, how much money India will need uh, to get rid of coal? Let me say that. Uh, they, uh, we have 24-7 renewable energy as grid parity. No one in India wants coal, okay? You have grid parity, renewable energy, and people, I don't see any economic rationale why uh, India should have, and therefore, uh, developed countries should invest huge amount of money in infrastructure to make sure that we have 24-7 renewable energy. That number cannot be quantified. Think about it right now. We have 300 million people who don't have access to electricity. And I'm not talking about one bulb and one mobile charger and one solar panel. That's not the kind of energy that the poor needs. If we can have everything, I think there is aspirations in poor as well. So, uh, you know, uh, you can put trillions of dollars on the table, uh, and, and still you will find that uh, the target is still a little far off. So uh, let me say that that number is not even being discussed in the corridors. Just to give you an example, if we are looking at 1.5 degrees uh, target, uh, then all the carbon budget analysis shows that the developed world must become zero emission, latest by 2025. That is the latest. And then the number, this number on finance should be trillions, not hundreds of billions. So let me uh, end there. Yeah. Assuming that the technology and the money exists, wouldn't it be wiser to first get the developed countries to stop using the coal that they do uh, instead of having a conversation on India? Because I understand the per capita consumption of coal in some countries of the world is five times to eight times higher than that of India. So are we barking up the wrong tree? Okay. Two more questions. I have Chetan here, and then I fall there, and then I have, we can take three questions. Four. We, we have time. We, we have time. Yeah. Fine. Chetan, yeah. And then keep the mic. One mic this side so yeah. we can. On the <clears throat> one issue which has been spoken here a lot is on <clears throat> the review mechanism, MRV. What have to say on the draft uh, which has given different options on MRV? Okay. The last one, Paul. Yep. Thank you very much, and it's really great to hear your uh, CSC's perspective on this. I wonder about an argument that's being made, though, some of it coming out of India, that focusing on the carbon budget and uh, requiring uh, India to seek its fair share. 
uh, may in fact hurt India in the long run. That actually uh, allowing India to go to use even any carbon budget at this point might actually in 30 years have India uh, uh, sort of um, less, in, uh, less industrialized perhaps than, um, than other countries. It's an argument I've read coming out of India, and I just wondered how CSC no, responds sorry. to that. So if we use our carbon budget, we will not be able to develop. I not, haven't well, that. yeah, that, 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 that you'll theoretically be behind in energy technologies in 30 years. Okay. So let me answer you on coal. Absolutely. I think uh, the debate here on coal and India is uh, quite misplaced. Uh, in fact, if you really want to uh, get rid of coal, in fact, why coal? Why not even gas? Developed was is, is investing hugely in gas. They are still going to build coal-based power plants. So I think the first thing they should do here at Paris is to commit to zero investment in fossil fuels, now and today. If they can do that, then I think there is a legitimacy in their voice, and then they can question India. They can legitimize. And fossil fuel meaning gas and coal. Oil and coal. Not this very selective Americanism that is going around, which is coal, coal is, is bad, bad and gas because is good. we found gas now. Okay. okay. So if fossil fuels and it's fossil fuel, okay, then it's gas and coal and across the developed world, because that is really where the quota has run out. And I think that is something that we do not hear of at all. We hear about Indian coal, and I want to point out to this report that we have done, CSE has done. It's called Capitan America. It is a report in which we have analyzed the United States Climate Action Program. We have done a detailed review of President Obama's Clean Power Plan, and our conclusion is that this action plan is nothing more than business as usual. That the U.S. was moving to gas because of economics and not because of climate change. There is absolutely no policy that the U.S. has put in which is climate-related. It is more to do with the economics. And more than that, our report says that the energy use in the U.S. will in fact be going up, that its per capita coal use will remain higher than India. Our report also says that the entire effort of the U.S. to invest in energy efficiency whether it is of its vehicles or whether it is of building appliances or of buildings to reduce energy is, will not happen because consumption is going up in the U.S. So our report essentially puts down very hard facts, and it is, very, it is not surprising for me that this report has been completely not written about in the American media. In fact, in a recent conversation that I had with a New York Times reporter, he said that he would not write on this report because it was produced by us and we are anti-American. So that's the tolerance of the global media that okay. we are talking about here. On Chetan MRV, uh, I think it is about capacity and capacity building is an important component, but we also think that MRV has to be differentiated in a way that certain countries have time and capacity to report. Reporting is important. CSE very strongly believe that we need right numbers on the table from everyone. I don't think there is any fear in developing countries to hide uh, their numbers, okay? It's, it's, it's more of a question of capacity. And I think from Paris, we should go out with a deal to build capacity, and then you can have the same, same amount of uh, reporting and transparency. Uh, Last point about Paul's point that if you... Yes, uh, Paul, uh, we are not likely to get even the fair share. So that argument actually is uh, not valid because in fair share, uh, we will get something. Without fair share, by 2030 when India's human development index will not be even 0.7, the carbon budget will be gone. And think about Africa. Large part of Africa's human development index will not even be 0.6, which means that the basic development needs you are talking from agriculture to infrastructure to shelter to industries. Uh, by the time they will start, they will, they will need carbon space, things will be over. So uh, that argument uh, is not correct. Okay. The last... Three questions, I think we have okay. time for. Yep, yes, please, please, please go ahead. Uh, hi. 
Uh, Joe Rome, Climate Progress. Um, I, let me stipulate the United States is not doing anywhere near as much as it should be doing. A little, little louder. Uh, uh, is this on? It's yeah. Yeah. Um, so the United States isn't doing enough for sure. Um, but everyone's going to zero, particularly under 1.5 C, and it's just a matter of decadal difference. So, uh, you know, I guess the question, and I, this is sort of building on the earlier question, in, India has to go to zero. And the question is, is it going to do what China did, uh, except in, a, in an accelerated time frame, which is to say, uh, build a lot of fossil fuels, ruin the environment of its cities, and then shut them down, and then build renewables, or surely, surely, even from a, a logical point of view, let alone a moral point of view, it, it, wouldn't it make sense simply to focus on going straight to renewables and finding the money and getting the money, because the money is there, and it is trillions, but it is mostly financing, so it's not squandered money. Why not just say... What our plan is, is to go be the first to renewables since that is going to, you know, set the pace for the world. And as the questioner said, that is going to lead to the industries and the jobs of the future. We've got the question. Let's get a few more questions in because we are running out of time. Yeah. Sunita, I have a question for you that uh, today, following up this question, uh, our minister uh, from uh, for climate change, Javadekar, has said that uh, it will depend on... Uh, Western words, uh, uh, Western countries' uh, f flexibility, how this deal goes. Happening or not happening, this deal will depend on f uh, flexibility and magnanimity of uh, the uh, okay. Western countries. How do, how do you com comment on that? Okay. Okay. So Any other questions? No. no. Okay. Last question. Did you have one? No. CV, do you want to take the first question? Okay. Uh, you know, we have a 100 gigawatt solar target. Uh, I think India is making that effort uh, in terms of uh, leapfrogging to renewables. I don't think there is, uh, if you look at the domestic debate in India, it is all about renewables right now. We are going to invest in renewables. But I think you need to understand three points. It's very easy to say that there is trillions of dollars on the table, but the interest rate on renewable energy, capital in interest on capital in India can be as high as 16%. I don't see any developed world coming in and saying that I'm going to give you a loan at 2%. Okay? I'm not talking about grant. I'm talking about financing investment at low interest rate. Not available. Africa is 26% interest rate. So I think the stock of billions on the table I don't see anywhere. So investment in renewable in India is happening with India's own money or uh, you know, some investment which is coming in because India is a, going to be a market for renewable energy. As far as we are concerned, we very strongly believe that, yes, co-benefit is an agenda for India. India should invest in renewable energy. But as I am talking about India, I think it is important for developed countries to also start investing in renewable energy. Okay? It is very easy argument to say that I have already built coal, and therefore it is going to be very expensive for me to go to renewables. Okay? I think that argument is not valid. Investment on renewable has to happen everywhere. India will do investment in renewable energy. And I, on your point, I don't agree with this point that China decided to build because there was a climate target for it. Okay? China built because its economy, economy was growing. Okay? It, built, it didn't build because keeping in mind that someone is going to stop China from building coal-based power plant. That wasn't the case. And I don't think we are going to be doing anything like that. Okay. Finished. I just want to make the last point here to say, and we can discuss this outside, that I think this is the kind of question that should not be asked. Because the fact is, that if the U.S. is really serious about it, then they should vacate the carbon space, give India its fair share, and let India choose which direction it takes. And maybe we could have a trading mechanism built into it. But you don't say that we will not give you a fair share because you don't really need it because we've finished it. We've consumed it all. And I think that's what we should have been discussing in Paris. We really are out of time, but thank you very much thank you. for coming. Thank you.